everyone. Welcome to ACE Online. A very good evening and welcome to Daily Current Affairs Initiative of 14th February. Okay. So fortunately, we have very less articles today. So it will wind up very soon. Uh, I mean, there are very much political news which are not relevant for our exams. There are three, four articles from the Hindu uh, as well as Indian Express uh, and two, three articles from Press Information Bureau. Okay. So we will see what are all the articles that we are going to cover for today. Of course, even though they are uh, short in number, but they are very much relevant for our exam. So we will see what are national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. We are not going to list out all the uh, wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. Rather, we will see what actually the difference between national parks and wildlife sanctuaries and the context. There was a new wildlife sanctuary declared in the Tamil Nadu. So that became an issue for the tribals who are residing there. We will discuss the issue as well. Along with that, we will see the details about national parks as well as wildlife sanctuaries. Okay. Next, there is a new temple being launched by our Honorable Prime Minister in UAE, BAPS Swaminarayan Temple. So we will see briefly, no need to worry about too much details because this is a new temple and we just need to know the, I mean the basic architecture where it is being established. So briefly that will be sufficient. No need to worry about too much technicalities in the temple. And then Nagorno Karambak region in the uh, you know Eastern Europe. So we will see what is the issue. This is an issue rather than a fact based. It is an issue based. We will see that. Then Apar ID. One nation, one student. Sorry, one student, one nation. Okay. I'm so sorry. One second. It is one student, one ID card. One student, one ID card. So this is collected from Press Information Bureau. It is very important. Then carbon nanotubes, again collected from PIB. We will briefly see what actually is carbon nanotubes. I will also show you one question asked in UPSC. Civil Services 2020 prelims at the end. Okay. We will also see biodiverse heritage sites. So new biodiversity heritage site was declared in Odisha. So we will see what actually is a biodiverse heritage sites. How many are there? What is the uh, you know uh, qualifications to select as a biodiverse heritage site? So we will see this. And finally, there is one fact and uh, the practice questions as well. Right? I hope you are ready for today's session. It won't take much time as I was telling you earlier. There are very few articles from today's papers. We will be discussing them. First, as I said, the, there is a concept called national parks as well as wildlife sanctuaries. Most of the students will conf confuse between what actually is national park and what actually is wildlife sanctuary. So I'll explain you what actually the difference between and what are the relevant facts for our exam. Okay. So the context why I have taken this article from the Hindu. I have taken this article from the Hindu. The context is this. There was a new declaration of Tantai Periyar Sanctuary. This will also be asked in the exam in Tamil Nadu. So which state has recently declared the Tantai Periyar Sanctuary? So Periyar is there. So you may confuse sometimes between Kerala as well as Tamil Nadu. So remember this. This is from Tamil Nadu. And that was affecting the lives of the tribals who are residing there. Right. So after government declaring as a site that it is going to be a new sanctuary, it has affected the tribes who are residing in that particular wildlife sanctuary region, forest region. We will see why it has affected and what is the solution, what is the background, why there was an issue of tribes and then uh, wildlife residing in wildlife sanctuary. We will see all the details, a little bit enhanced, I mean a little bit elaboration is needed. But before that, what we need to know? We need to know what actually is a national park and what actually is a wildlife sanctuary. What is the thin difference between these two, right? So national park, in the term itself it is saying, national park, park means what? Where there is some ecosystem rather than any particular wildlife. Say for example, if you are talking about zoo, there will be animals, specifically for animals. But here it is talking about a park, like forest, green, green land, right? So a greenery land it is talking about. So national park is nothing but a total area, a big area, which is having an, uh, you know, protecting a unique environment there. So it is not about wildlife. It is not about birds. It is not about specific species. It is everything, all the environment. It, it should be 
completely a general habitat which can accommodate different species, different type of habitats. So it is called as a natural park. So if government feels that there is an area in any particular state, even if state governments feel that there is a particular area which is unique in environment that need to be protected, those are called as national park. So it is a bigger, wider term, general term rather than specific thing which covers all type of habitats, whether animals, birds, plants, humans. So everything is included and this, they, those areas are called as national parks. Okay. So they are typically much larger than wildlife sanctuaries. We will see what actually is wildlife sanctuary also. Then you will understand much better way. What is the thin difference between these two? So this is national parks are much bigger in size than wildlife sanctuaries. Human activities are strictly prohibited completely prohibited. You cannot enter, you cannot do any activities inside unless until there is an exemption to the tribal people and all. But in general, human activities are completely prohibited within the national parks. Okay. So the boundaries also, which boundary should be part of national park will also be clearly mentioned. This area at this side, so the total amount of area, the fencing, everything will be clearly specified for the national park. Okay. So they can be declared both central government as well as state government. This was asked in the previous exams. Any governments, either central government as well as the state government can declare any area as a national park, right? So because this power is given to state governments because land is of state government, right? In the concurrent list of, oh sorry, in the seventh schedule, it is part of state list. Land is a part of state list. So that's why both center as well as state government can declare it. There is no alteration of boundaries. So once the area is declared as a national park, the area of the national park cannot be changed unless until state legislature is bringing some new act. So just by government will, they cannot change. The state legislature has to pass a separate bill to change the area or alter the area of the national park. Right? So you can see there is a strict regulation of national park, isn't it? So nobody should enter. The areas are clearly specified. The areas cannot be changed, right? So all these are little bit more stricter in nature. Now we will see what actually is wildlife sanctuary. You will get an idea after listening this, the thin differences. So it is a land specifically given to protection of certain animals. So here the name itself is suggesting national park. There is a green land, but here wildlife, that means specific to protection of some animals, right? So this is a area where specific conservation is taken. For example, in, uh, you know, if you take, uh, you know, Sri Venkateswara Geological Park or uh, in Tirupati, that is specific to some animals like elephants, right? So also Rantambore, we have a tiger to protect there. Simlipal, there is a, again tiger, right? Sundarban Wildlife Sanctuary, again it is for Royal Bengal Tiger. So these wildlife sanctuaries are specifically to protect the animals rather than conserving the whole environment like national parks. These are specific to protection of animals. The boundaries of wildlife of sanctuaries are not specified. So unlike national parks, there is no specified. It, they will declare that this area is a wildlife sanctuary. So it can be expanded. It can be reduced according to the will of the government. Unlike national parks, right? So both wildlife sanctuary as well as national parks are declared under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Okay. So this act provides the declaration of national parks as well as wildlife sanctuaries. So this question can be asked in the exam from which act the state governments or central government can declare as wildlife sanctuaries or national parks. Okay. I hope you have understood what is the difference between uh, you know wildlife sanctuary and national park. Yeah, very good evening, AMCPWD. You have any query? The difference between uh, the wildlife sanctuary and national park. I hope you understood. We have seen the context, but we went to what actually is national park and what actually is wildlife sanctuary and what is the difference between them, right? So I hope this is clear for you. Now, with this background, let's understand what is the issue that is happening in Tamil Nadu, right? So only if you understood what is the concept of wildlife sanctuary national park, then only you will be able to follow this issue. Okay. I hope you are clear. I, as I did not get any doubt, I am going forward. So what is the issue here? 
Recently, Tamil Nadu government has declared certain uh, region as a wildlife sanctuary. Okay, but now these areas which tribes are residing, okay, said that it is against the rights given to them. There are already some laws, some rules and regulations where the tribes has derived their rights. For example, they can do some small agriculture, they can collect some forest produce. So these are all their rights because they are living in this area since not just decades but in centuries their generation were living in that particular area. Now they are, now you are declaring it as a wildlife sanctuary but we are residing in this area since thousands of years from generations. So it is against their rights, given to their rights. That's what they have said. And it was denying their basic rights. Okay. So this is to make you understand the context that Tamil Nadu has government has declared this and the tribes are saying that it is against their rights. Now, why it is against their rights? That is also need to be understood. Okay. So here in 1990, we will see, we are discussing now why it is against the rights of the tribes. Okay. Why the Tamil Nadu government declaration is against the rights, how it became. Now, first we will understand the background. In 1990, way back of, I mean, approximately 30 years before, Union Environment Ministry, that is central government, has declared that all forest villages, remember here the word forest villages, that means those villages in any particular state which are having more forest area. For example, you come to Delhi or Hyderabad, so there will be less amount of forest. But if you go to the western guards like Karnataka region, Kerala region, there is much forest uh, area. So there will be certain villages where the amount of forests are much higher. So government has said that the forest villages, the concept was way back during the Britishers. They exploited a lot of uh, forest by, you know, dwelling out the forest or uh, the tribes residing there. So this concept of forest village was declared by Britishers. This was removed by Ministry of Environment saying that all forest villages should be declared as revenue villages by the respective state governments. So in 1990 itself, Ministry of Environment said the state governments that all the villages should be declared, all the forest villages should be declared as revenue villages rather than making them remain in forest villages. So what is the difference? Forest villages is derived from way back Forest Right Act of 1927 during Britishers that nothing is allowed in this. So no, you should not cut the trees, you should not use it uh, for any purposes. It was very strict during Britishers. And this revenue villages was the concept introduced by Indian government that they can allow the human activities, especially for tribal people. So here the restriction is less, here the restriction is more, that nothing can be done in the tribes. So that is the difference. Now what your environment ministry said to all the states, declare all forest villages as revenue villages so that the human activities for the tribal people can be allowed in those forests. But what has happened here, same thing was already also said by Forest Right Act 2006. We will also see about this. Environmental Ministry has said in 2000, sorry, 1990 and in 2006, Forest Right Act was also bought and the same has said that forest villages should be converted to the revenue villages and allow the tribes to live there. But many of the states, including Tamil Nadu, has not taken any measure. They did not declare the forest villages as revenue villages. That means what? So forest villages are regulated with much strictness that no activities are allowed. So here Tamil Nadu government has not declared them. So what is happening here? All the tribes are not able to get the resources there. Once the area is declared as wildlife sanctuary or national park, all the tribes will be get out of it and it is very strict regulation from the government until unless they declare it as a revenue village. But Tamil Nadu government has not done that. Right? So then uh, what will happen now? Of course, until unless they declare it as a revenue villages, the tribes cannot exploit the uh, you know basic livelihood what they want from the forest. That is the issue. Why the tribe said that their rights has been violated. Even though Ministry of Environment has given the nod and Forest Right Act also given the permission, still they were not able to enjoy because all their villages were still remaining as a forest villages rather than a revenue villages. Right? So that why, that's why they have said that their rights was violated. And what about Wildlife Protection Act 1972? What they said? 
this also we need to know. I hope you are clear. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, you are understanding, you are following, I hope. Now, this is a little bit different from the actual issue. Now, we already understood the issue, why their rights has been violated. We also need to know some facts for our exam related to the Wildlife Protection Act. So, what this act says, people inside sanctuaries can continue to enjoy all the rights until unless prohibited, right? So, if any, if there is a wildlife sanctuary, if government has declared that particular area is a wildlife sanctuary. So, the tribes residing here can, you know, continue to enjoy the rights. They can, uh, you know, collect the forest produce. They can do whatever, like, naturally want, they can do. Until, unless, if state government specifically saying that you should not do this particular activity, right? So, the tribals can do anything. But for national park, for national park, nothing is allowed. For national park, even the tribals are not allowed to do except in few exception cases. National parks are not allowed to exploit through human activities. But wildlife sanctuaries can be allowed until unless government is saying that this thing should not be done. Right? So this is what the Wildlife Protection Act is saying related to the wildlife sanctuaries as well as national park. This also you need to know from the exam point of view. Okay? Also one more thing it says. No new rights are permitted, even in wildlife sanctuaries, whatever they are doing since many years to collect the forest produce, to do uh, some shifting cultivation or agriculture, small agriculture, those activities are allowed. But new activities, for example, they want to do commercially uh, collect the wood, those things are not allowed. Whatever they are doing since many years, only those are allowed. That's what the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 says. Now, Finally, we need to know about the Forest Rights Act as well. I just want to give you brief background. If you are a student of modern history, you might be already aware about it. Uh, during Britishers, like they came as a traders, but they have occupied most part of the India and they have exploited everything from Indian continent, right? So under this, forests are also one such important category. Brit like, you know, most of the tribes were residing in uh, tribal regions like Koyas, you can say Bill, right, Gones, those people are residing in the forest areas, but Britishers was necessitated to collect the wood to construct of railways, buildings and all. So they have brought lot of acts, laws, and they have strictly regulated the activity of tribals. Their own, the, the tribals own region were regulated by the Britishers, right. So since that time, till 2006, same laws were followed in India. So they were not allowed to enter into the forest, collect those things, commercial activities, whatever the things the tribals were doing. Since Britishers, till 2006, there was no permission for the tribes, even after 50 years of independence. So after a lot of struggles, a lot of you know, debates, discussions, government has bought Forest Rights Act 2006 to give permissions for the tribes to take care of the livelihood within the forests. Right? I hope you understood the necessity of bringing the Forest Rights Act. Now, what are the provisions of the Act? That is also important for our exam. Let's understand some important provisions. Of course, the whole Act cannot be read and that is also not relevant for our exam. We will just see the important provisions. The tenural security over the forest land is given prior. So, whoever is occupying before December 2005, the land, the activities that they are doing, will be allowed from now onwards, from 2006 onwards, it will be allowed. But after activities, new activities after 2005 will not be allowed. That is one provision. And then recognition of a community right over forest and forest products. So community means all coming together. There is a single tribe with 200 population or 150 people. So all together, they can own the certain things like forest products, like honey, you can say, right? So wood or tendu leaves. So it enabled that these forest particular products are owned by the tribals residing there. So that was also allowed by Forest Right Act 2006. Next, protection and conservation of community forest resources. See, there are certain, not certain, most of the tribes feel that forests are like, uh, you know, gods. They pray for forest areas, certain, you can call them as a, you know, temples also. Forests are considered as a temples by the most of the tribes. So whatever the sacred places are there, that also will be protected. 
no other people can enter there and they can destroy the forest. That was also derived from 2006 Act, which is a very good provision. Then conservation of all forest villages and habitation located in such forest into a revenue villages. So this is a point that we were discussing earlier. Forest Right Act itself said that all the forest villages, which was declared by the forest as a, oh, sorry, British as a strict forest, will be converted into re revenue villages and accordingly, whoever is eligible to work there can be allowed, like tribes, right? Then all rehabilitation works, when, wherever is required, recognition of ancestral domain. So, since ages their ancestors were living there, so it will be also recognized under the act. See, such a good provisions, but we were failed to implement it properly. You can just check in the internet. Forest Right Act was not properly implemented even after uh, launching it in 2006. So, you can understand how the tribes are suffering in the region. We are re residing in cities and we are having a very sophisticated life. But even to get the basic livelihood, they are struggling, right? So, this is particular vulnerable tribal groups were also recognized under Forest Right Act. So, these are all the provisions given under the Forest Right Act. Now, few important things are there. This forest dwelling, scheduled tribes and other dwelling tribes, uh, they have, it was given the right to ownership of land up to 4 hectares. So, what amount of land any tribes can occupy in the forest? So, if they are claiming that we have a patas, since many ages, this land is being habituated by our ancestors. So, up to 4 hectares, the tribes, any individual can own the land. Any individual in the sense, the any tribal individual can own the land there. Then, ownership is only for land, that is actually being cultivated. So, whatever the agriculture you are doing, only that land will be given to you, not the other extra land which you may claim, right? So, only the agriculture land that you are cultivating since many years will be, uh, you know, given for the right. So, these are the two important provisions, factual provisions under the Act. The rights of dwellers extend to extract for minor forest produce. So, minor forest produce means honey, tendu, excluding the commercial logging like bamboo, wood, logging. So, excluding those things. So, the, for, the tribes can go directly and extract this minor forest produce and they can sell in the, you know, local markets to rehabilitate in case of illegal eviction. So, if there is an illegal eviction, for example, government want to, uh, you know, construct some, some dam. So, illegally, in the sense like state should not do illegal things, but somehow they forcefully does that because we need development also. So, if that, in that case, there will be a proper rehabilitation with support from the government. So, all the provisions of this forest rate acts was we have discussed. Any doubts in this? Right? So, this is very important thing. It is not only exam point of view. So, you can see that lot of tribes are still struggling after even getting independence since 75 years. Right? So, this question is, uh, this topic is very, very important. So, even beyond the context, I have told you about the Forest Right Act and all. So, try to remember that. Next, BAPS Swami Narayan Temple. So, this is very factual thing. Recently, Prime Minister has visited UAE and it was being launched. This is the first temple in the Gulf nation. So, you know the Gulf region, Persian Gulf region. We have Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain. So, we have number of countries. Among those, this is the first country that is being, sorry, first temple, Hindu temple being constructed in UAE. So, this is going to be launched by our Honorable Prime Minister today, right? So, that's why we have taken it. Now, let's understand what actually is BAPS. Bochasnav Swami Akshar Purushottama Swami Narayan Sanstha. So, it is like a sect. Within Hinduism, we have different sects, right? Swami Narayan sect, you can say, Sai Baba cult, you can say. So, there are number of sects and cults within Hinduism. So, this is one such denomination or you can say sect or cult established for Vaishnava. So, Vaishnava sect means it is Vishnu, right? So, Shavite means Lord Shiva. So, this is a sect under Hinduism who is worshipping the Vaishnava, that is Lord Vishnu. So, this is the BAPS, this is the separate sect in the Hinduism. Now, you, if you are a person from Delhi, you might be aware Akshadham temple is also there. It is one of the biggest in India. So, if you are at to visit, you can also visit there. 
this is also belongs to BAPS. Okay. So here let's discuss about the small features of the temple that is being uh, launched in UAE. It is built in Nagara style. So if you could able to recall our temple architecture, we have discussed when we were discussing about the Ayodhya temple. There are two temple styles. One is Dravidan, that is who follow in the south, southern part of India and then Nagara style. So this is followed in the northern part of India. So this temple was constructed in the Nagara style with Panchayatana. We have discussed this in the previous session. You can go back and you can watch it. So the temple's front panel depicts universal values. That is peace. Universal values means what? Peace, having harmony, supporting all cultures. So all these things, this is a very generic point. No need to worry. The total area of the temple is 13.5 acres of land. This was gifted by Muhammad bin Jaid al Nahyan. So then president of UAE has gifted this land for construction of the temple. The total height of the temple is 108 feet and the marble used, the pink stones were used, sandstone were used from Rajasthan and some Italian marbles were used in the temple. So this is very factual in nature. I hope it is clear. Now let's move to one more issue, issue based discussion. After this there are two more which are factual in nature. So it is an issue based which was news since many months, but today also I have able to see one news in the Hindu that Armenia and Azerbaijan accused each other in the fire. Like you know how India Pakistan have the border issue. The same there is an issue between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Okay. So there was a accusation on each other. This was reported in the Hindu. Now let's understand what is the issue between these two countries. There is a I will explain everything here only rather than doing it in a slide basis, a point basis. I will explain you the whole issue here so you will be able to understand it clearly. There is a region you can see here, yes. So this is a slight, slightish yellow one, white color one. It is called as Nagorno Karambak region. Nagorno Karambak region. This region is located in Azerbaijan. Okay, there are two countries, Azerbaijan and Armenia. So please understand this, this is very important. Without understanding the issue, you won't be able to follow the facts. So there is a Nagaro Karambak region, which is lying in Azerbaijan. It is located in Azerbaijan, but here occupied by Armenian people, Armenian ethnic tribes. They are also tribes. So the Christians, the Armenia is a Christianity based country and Azerbaijan is Islam based country. Okay. This is Christianity and then Islam. So here, even though this Nagoro Karambok region is lying in Azerbaijan, the people here are occupied from Armenia ethnic origin. Okay. These people are Christian origin who are, you know, situated in Azerbaijan. Why it has happened? Because you all are aware that Russia was earlier part of USSR, right? Union uh, Socialist Republic. So earlier it was USSR in 1991. It was disintegrated because of lot of economical issue, political issues. USSR, you know, divided into many countries, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, all these countries were derived from USSR only. And the main country was Russia. So USSR was disintegrated into many parts. During that time itself, these people occupied, this Armenian people has occupied in this region. And Azerbaijan was not very strong. Armenia was supported by Russia. Okay. So Armenia was supported by the Russia. So that's why Azerbaijan did not question. Even if this region was occupied by Arme Armenian ethnic people, they did not question, they did not fought because Russia was with the side of Armenia. Now what has happened during COVID, especially during 2020, Russia was also weak, right, economically and there was also going about the conflict. Azerbaijan attacked this region and then they have occupied most part of it. They have drove away the ethnic tribes, I mean ethnic people of Armenia from here. So the people have visited and this region was occupied by Azerbaijan and Russia also did not intervene. It said two countries should, you know, cooperate each other and discuss and accordingly solution has to be found, right? So this is the issue. Now as Armenia also got weak and Azerbaijan also has a support from Islam countries like Turkey. So this was the conflict between two countries. This Armenia want 
the tribes to reside in this region and Azerbaijan want to vacate this people ethnic origin of uh, Armenian Christians and they want to give this region to the Azerbaijan people. So that is why it is there in news. The conflict is still going on like how Pakistan occupied Kashmir we are fighting between India and Pakistan we are trying to take it back and Pakistan is want to make it stay with it. So the same way this region is being conflicted between the two countries. Okay. So I hope it is clear. Any doubts in this? I hope it is clear. Now if there is any fact we can this fact these points are all the same thing that I have discussed. Uh, this region is located in the Caucasus region. So Caucasus mountains this also can be asked. So let's take care of facts also. This region is landlocked. If you see this orange color, this is a landlocked. That's how the questions can be framed. It is not border with any oceans. It is a landlocked, mountains dominated and forest uh, you know, dominated region. It is located in Caucasus region. This is also an important fact. Okay. And this region is roughly made of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia as well. One more country, Georgia. But anyhow, it is very slight and it is not involved in the conflict. Okay. So dispute I have discussed the Soviet Union and the ceasefire and then the after that how during the COVID times they became stronger. So we have discussed it. I hope you are clear with the most facts that question come from is from which region this is part and is it landlocked and what is the issue in which country they are sharing. Right. Any doubts in this? Right. Let's move to the next article that is factual uh, element only. Two more articles. Apar ID. The full form we will see. Uh, it is counted as one nation, one student ID card. So you can see the context is very simple. That recently a meeting of Ministry of Education conference was happened on Apar. Okay. So from here itself we will get some clue. Now let's go details about this. What is Apar? Okay. Let's before discussing these points, let's understand how the school is working uh, in the current scenario. There are number of students, there is number of schools, right? And every school have different feature of ID card and each student have different type of certificates, different type of, uh, you know, uh, ID cards. So it is very complex. If a student has done his schooling for two years in one school and has shifted to other school, there is a change of ID card and then marks also we need to transfer, we need to take TC. So there is a lot of complexity. There is no uniformity across India, right? So government want to bring a single identity card. It is like a digital one. Everything will be stored. Like how much marks you got in the previous school, how much improvement you have been done. So everything will be kept in a single database for each of the student. So that is the basic theme of APAR card. So it is nothing but a unique identification system for all the students across India. So for example, if I'm studying in Kerala, and for next two years, I am shifting because my father has been transferred to Jammu Kashmir. I will go there. I will have a different type of format, different type of approach in the studies. So here, if I am having unique identification number, ID card, so that school will monitor how I performed in Kerala, how can I accommodate in the Jammu Kashmir. So this is a unique identification system like Aadhaar only, similar to Aadhaar. It will have a, a unique ID card for all the students. Okay. So it is a 12 digit ID, very, very important. What is the uh, Aadhaar number? Anyone from, uh, how many numbers are will be there in Aadhaar? How many digits will be there in Aadhaar? Anyone? So it is 16, right? So total 4, 4, 4 differently, they will give 4. So it is a 16. This is a 12 digit ID. Simplifi simplifying the tracking and academic progress of all the students who are educated through from starting from primary like from LKG till graduation everything will be streamlined monitored it will be a gate a gateway for digi locker as well now you you might aware about it digi digi locker so this is nothing but storing your documents digitally earlier like whenever I'm traveling with my certificates my father used to call that uh, be careful of certificates because once they lost it is very difficult to reclaim now government has introduced digi locker in 2016 or 17 that my all certificates will be stored digitally i just need to scan them and keep it in a, a software to store my so to store my document so whenever i need it i can just give the code and it will automatically upload from the digital digi locker 
for example i was whenever i was applying my upsc civil service exam um, in since last many years so when i was giving my attempts so i used to just give my digi locker code so all the certificates will be uploaded automatically so this is digi locker and government is trying to interlink these two things i'll have all the marks i'll have all my tcs everything will be at one place connecting to the one single id and this will be also connected to the digi locker to save my documents that is the aim right so features of uh, apar unique identification so a single identification no two students will have a same id seamless data transfer so whenever the data transfer required from one place to other place it will easily happen all inclusive repository so no discrimination will be there every student is eligible then empowering state government so whenever there is a back you know backlog from some some students who are not performing state governments will have or uh, can monitor their performance and they can encourage the students to do much better way and combating fraud as well so someone uh, you know because of use of misuse of certificates so there is a lot of frauds happen and this can also be contained through apar okay okay no problem it is a 16 uh, digit number next one carbon nanotubes we are not going to discuss very technical that is not relevant for our exams just will make you understand the basic concept okay about carbon nanotubes and how they can be utilized okay that is that will be sufficient for our exam so the context is this recently in pib government website it was mentioned that a new method for sodium catalyzed synthesis of carbon nanotubes could be useful in recharge batteries flexible electronics so it it becomes very complex to understand this so don't worry it is very simple that new method was introduced to synthesize carbon nanotubes which will be helpful in a further manner in the coming electronics so now he, once you understand the carbon nanotubes then only you will understand the context what is this particular thing government has said now let's understand the carbon nanotubes you can understand that you can observe the diagram once right so now let's understand they are cylindrical molecules thin molecules of carbon they are thin molecules of carbon so these are all carbon elements very thin so which can be make very thin sheet so right and with they are very strong they are very strong because it consists of carbon which are very strong it is also called as graphene whenever there is a carbon molecules constructed in part of synthetic material it is called as graphene so they are very thin layer nano it's like a very 10 power minus 9 uh, you know meter much thinner so they are make into very sheet and they are very strong even though they are thin they are very strong so this can be molded in any way they won't break at all it can be used in many ways right so wherever it is needed so carbon nanotubes are nothing but they are cylindrical molecules of carbon made into thin sheets okay at the 10 power minus 9 meters of thickness right so those are the carbon nanotubes they are extremely robust difficult to break but they are very light so they are robust and difficult to break they are very light very light weight as well as thin it can be used in electronic wires so now copper is being used so if you could able to introduce these things it will become much easy they won't break copper you can easily break the electric wire that is copper wire with uh, mouth but with the teeth but this is this won't be possible so the time the possible working of this particular wires can be extended for many years and then they can replace silicon in transistors so if you are a physics student so the silicon is being used in transistors so here this can be used and they can also be used in the manufacturing of solar cells much more applications are still to be evolved but this is the basic application last one for today biodiversity heritage sites the context is gupteshwar forest very very important to remember in odisha is declared as a new biodiverse heritage site so they will directly ask where is gupteshwar forest uh, located so it is in odisha it was declared as a biodiverse biodiversity heritage site that's why we have taken the context or article now let's understand what actually are biodiversity heritage sites there is a proper definition given by ministry of environment these are the areas which are having unique ecologically fragile ecosystems that means if there is a if there will be any human interventions then 
these areas will be affected in a larger manner. There will be some keystone species, important species. If there is any small change, these are very fragile. Immediately there will be a lot of changes in the ecosystem and ultimately it will also affect the people. Okay. So some provisions are there. These are declared under Biodiversity Conservation Act. Two thousand two. Remember, they are not declared under Environmental Protection Act or Wildlife Sanctuary, Wildlife Protection Act. They are declared under Biodiversity Conservation Act of two thousand two. Under this section, the the Act, Biodiversity Act, will give has given the powers to state government to notify any any site as the uh, biodiversity heritage sites through the help of local bodies. So remember this: here, state government is declaring, not the central government. That is important. These sites are declared by the state governments with the help of consultation with the local bodies. The government, the act, Biodiversity Act also given power to state governments in consultation with the central government. Here, they need the consultation of the central government, may frame rules to manage them. How to manage that after declaration of biodiversity heritage site? How to be managed? Which activities to be allowed? What type of conservation practice are needed? With the help of central government, they can notify those rules as well. Right? So this is about biodiversity heritage sites. We have seen the definition and what is the power of state governments. Right? Now parameters, which areas can be selected as biodiversity heritage sites? It was also given by Ministry of Environment. Very generic, species richness, that means more animals, more species, more birds should be there. High endemism, that means some species should be only restricted to that area. Okay? So if, the, if you are changing one animal from this place to other place, it won't survive. For example, you can uh, take an example of uh, Jordan Cursor from Andhra Pradesh. It is only restricted to the regions of Karnul and Rayasima region. Or also you can see, uh, you can take Great Indian Bustard which was in use. It was specific to desert region of Rajasthan and some Gulf, region, uh, Gulf of Kutch region in Gujarat. So if you are changing, it will die. So similarly, this region will have a specific uh, uh, flow, I mean fauna there. Presence of rare threatened species. And then keystone species, presence of wildlife ancestors, areas with significant culture and ethnic. So these are all very generic. You can just understand them. So all these conditions are the you know criteria to declare the biodiverse heritage sites. Now there are important facts for uh, exam to be remembered. Total number as of 2024 January, today itself the Ministry of Environment has noted, there are total 44 such biodiverse heritage sites in India. Okay. First one was Nallur Tamarind Grove in Karnataka. It was declared in 2007. Very important. Which one is the first biodiverse heritage site? Nallur Tamarind Grove in Bengaluru was the first site. As of now, the most number of sites are in Tripura and Maharashtra. Total 5 are there. 5 in Tripura and 5 in Maharashtra. Okay. So that is about today's issues. Now let's see one fact. There is a international conference on solar thermal technologies happened in New Delhi. International conference on solar thermal technologies in New Delhi. It was conducted by Solar Energy Corporation of India in collaboration with National Solar Energy Federation of India. That is all the companies associated with the national industries which are associated with the solar energy. Right. So what is the issue why they are conducting to deliberate integrate of solar thermal energy into our renewable technologies. So to enhance the role of solar energy. So those are the issues. Now let's solve the MCQs for today. Even though there are less articles, but we have very good questions collected from uh, UPSC civil service as, a, as well as some other exams. First question, consider the following statements. Boundaries of national parks are marked by legislation. First one, cultivation and grazing activities are not allowed inside the national park. So that is the second statement. Any uh, answer from your side? Boundaries of national park are marked by legislation. And then second is cultivation and grazing activities are not allowed inside national park. Yes, this is correct. National boundaries are done through legislation. That's why they cannot change. If they want to change, they need to bring the again legislation. 
This is also correct. Cultivation and grazing activities are not allowed inside national park, but in wildlife sanctuary, it is allowed. So answer is C. Not A, it is C because in wildlife sanctuaries, they are allowed, but not in the national parks. Okay, this, they are strictly prohibited. Second question, recently, BAPS Swaminarayan Temple, the first Hindu temple in Gulf nation, was inaugurated in. Very straightforward question. Okay. So, this is a very straightforward question. You can answer this. There, there is no difficulty. I am waiting for your answer. Second one. Where it is being launched? Second one, someone said Abu Dhabi. Yes, answer is Abu Dhabi. You are correct. It was launched in, it was going to be launched in Abu Dhabi. Next. Nagorno Karabakh region is subject of dispute between which of the following countries? So, we have discussed the issue, not an issue, right? So, here you just need to identify the fact between which countries it is an issue. Armenia, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. So, answer is very straightforward. It is nothing but Armenia and Azerbaijan. Yes, so answer is again B. Next, with reference to automated permanent academic account registry, this is the full form of APAR, automated permanent academic account registry, which of the following statements are correct? Okay, first statement, it is a system that tracks the academic performance of the students in real time. So immediately performance, based on the performance of the students, it will immediately record then, the APAR ID is linked to the stu student's Aadhaar number, which ensures that each student has a unique and tamper-proof identification. So, that is the second statement. APAR ID is expected to help, the, uh, help to reduce burden on students and parents. This is the fourth question. This is a little bit tricky. I will see how the students will answer this. Okay. First statement is correct yes because it is it tracks academic performance on real time basis second one it will link it to the students are there no it won't link it will have a 12 digit unique number so it won't link so two is wrong so you can eliminate first is correct yes it will reduce the burden on the student uh, students as well as parents to maintain the certificates all these things so answer is one and three four is actually b very good malini uh, you have understood it, right? So, I was expecting this because it was attached other as a number here. Okay, very good. Last question, with reference to carbon nanotubes, consider the following statements. So, this was asked in the exam of UPSC Civil Services 2020. They can be used as a carrier of drugs, antigens in the human body. Carbon nanotubes can be used to carry the drugs into the human body. They can be made into artificial blood capillaries, capillaries or in the injured parts of the human body. So we have, uh, uh, I mean, natural capillaries, right, within uh, our human body. So they are saying that carbon nanotubes can be made as a uh, artificial blood capillaries. They can be used in the biochemical sensors. Carbon nanotubes are biodegradable. That means easily, you know, dissolved or disintegrated, right? So when the key was released, like everyone has given it as a D, but the actual answer given was 134 because this artificial blood capillaries was not yet tested. Even today, we don't have that technology in the working, right? So that's why this statement was wrong and answer is C. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the session. This was a little bit short because we don't have or uh, too much articles today, uh, okay? So thanks a lot, keep following, keep supporting us. Uh, a very good evening and have a great day. Thank you.